Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to the Navigating the Ethical Landscape Responsible AI in Practice panel. As you can see, we have an exciting panel here prepared for you. Um, just very quickly, um, I just uh, want to um, kind of uh, introduce myself. My name is Annie Lai. I am currently chairing the Generative AI Commons. So for those of you who attended the keynote this morning, you heard Ibrahim talking about Generative AI Commons. We were launched last December. In a very short six months, we bootstrap this, um, this committee. And um, our goal is to um, democratize, accelerate the you know, AI, Generative AI, and adoption, um, development and adoption in a collaborative way via open source, open tooling, open science. And um, we are currently, we have over 100 active members and um, coming from over 60 uh, member companies. And it is a very, it's an open membership. In other words, you don't have to belong to any Linux Foundation members, official members, anybody in the world. As long as you have the passion for generative AI, you are welcome to come and participate and dial into our meetings. We have bi-weekly meetings, and um, each work stream also uh, has a bi-weekly meetings. And um, it is a community driven, so if you are passionate about a specific topic, you can just raise that topic in any of the work streams, and then you know invite people who share the same passion and work with you on the initiative. And um, our goal is to build generative AI um, in a responsible, ethical way. And this is how we are organized. We have currently have five work streams, as you can see here, and we can never have enough people. So please join us. And even if you are brand new to AI, you're welcome to come and learn. And you know, and over time, you build up your experience in AI. You can participate. You can contribute. And maybe you can lead initiatives and projects. And um, so responsible, as you can see, responsible AI is a very big part of generative AI comments because we believe that we're going through this explosive growth in generative AI. But we should slow down and think about you know, how we can build AI in a responsible way. And th this is why we're having this panel. And since this is an open source conference, so we're gonna discuss responsible AI in the context of open source. Okay, and um, this one is from Responsible AI Workstream. They asked me to show this slide. Please look at the QR code. And uh, this workstream is very exciting. Every time when we have a meeting, we have lots of people, lots of ideas. And currently, they are working on responsible AI framework. Um, that work is being led by a professor from a university. And it's a very exciting work. And we are expecting to have the first draft of responsible AI framework done by AI Dev Hong Kong, which is August. 21st through 23rd. Okay, now I'm gonna start the panel. As you can see, we have four panelists, and these are the our elite panelists who have been in the trenches in the area of responsible AI. So without further ado, I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves to you. And please introduce yourself, and especially um, talk about your role in responsible AI. Um, Adrian, uh, you first. Oh, so okay. we'll go from here. There. Perfect. Later we'll come from there back here. We we. Okay, my microwave. <laughs> microphone is not working. Okay, now it's working. Okay, cool. Now it's powerful. Now yeah. we can hear it. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for being here. I'm very excited to share this space with all these professional, with people that I usually see in two dimensions. And uh, well, I'm Adrian Gonzalez. I'm part of different organizations. I teach at university level in Canada, HEC Montreal, and in Spain, IE University. I teach uh, different topics, including AI regulations, responsible AI, and compliance. And um, I'm part of the Responsible AI work stream, so we collaborate on the activities you were mentioning. Um, I collaborate or, or I contribute more or less depending on the availability, but I'm, I'm very proud to be part of this community. A national level from the Spanish European point of view, I'm part of the National uh, Observatory in Spain, like Odisea. Uh, that is working not only in Responsible AI, but also how to um, translate and what the regulations are saying into something that we can do on the day-to-day. -day. 
And then I'm coming also from Microsoft. I'm the data and AI specialist. In that case, from that perspective, I'm the, the subject of the internal standards, so how we implement AI internally and with the clients uh, in a responsible manner. So very happy to be here. Awesome. Marco? Thank you. Hello, I'm Mirko Böhm. I'm with Linux Foundation Europe. Um, and as such, Linux Foundation is the host of many of the AI projects that you meet here today. And um, we are representing those projects and the Linux Foundation a lot with policymakers in Brussels and other places. And so I might be the uh, exotic person on the panel here because my background is primarily in, um, in representing open source, also in regulation. Um, and the IAC was, of course, one of the key topics. Um, and I'm also uh, a visiting professor for open source and intellectual property in Berlin. So uh, full background. Thank you. Cool. Waiter? Hello, I am Awita Coleman, and I um, am, uh, lead the Open Voice Trust Mark Initiative. That's, that's um, how I'm part of the responsible AI community. Um, the Open Voice Trust Mark Initiative is a, an independent organization under the LFAI and Data Foundation. Our role is to educate and advocate on the trustworthy use of conversational AI and the intersection with generative AI. I um, am a member of the, um, of the Education and Outreach Committee, led by OFER, um, and we are, um, and our role there is we're helping to put together training courses in particular. Our focus is um, on the Linux Foundation edX platform. We have a, a general course, introductory course, um, and we can talk about that more when we go on. But, but right now, um, I just wanted to just share with you that we were excited to, we are new, a new organization under the LFAI and data umbrella. And so we're really looking to contribute um, there. So. Great. Pedro? Uh, so thank you. Thanks for the invitation. So I'm Pedro Ortiz Suarez. Uh, I'm a senior research scientist at the uh, Common Crawl Foundation. Um, well, in terms of responsible AI, I mean, first thing that I have to say is, well, uh, Common Cloud Foundation has been there for 17 years, exist, like way before we started talking about AI. But having said that, uh, I think probably the three most important axes are, well, we want to work on diversity, so we want uh, the data that people are using in AI solutions to be as diverse as possible and as representative, uh, representative as possible. Uh, second one uh, is probably accessibility. So, well, not all people uh, can actually have the resources to actually access, exploit the data, and then actually train the models. So we want to make uh, the data as accessible and as, let's say, annotated as much as possible so that people can actually easily target what they actually want. And finally, again, since we exist like way before, like the LLMs, uh, we have been trying to democratize web solu well, web technologies for 17 years now. Uh, and right now in the AI conversation, we want to uh, research opt-out protocols so that you can, let's say, opt out your data out of, the, of these AI models without literally opting out of the entire web or like erasing yourself from the web. So, yep. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you for the introductions. Okay, so um, question number one. Um, um, since we are in this open source community um, conference, um, I'd like to ask the panelists, what are the challenges and benefits of fostering a collaborative approach to responsible AI in, within the open source community? Um, who would like to answer? Merkel, would you, would you like to tackle this question? I can try, it's a very difficult question. <laughs> um, so at the heart of any responsible AI lies a, a massive trust issue in the end, because we're operating systems that we all know currently, we roughly understand how they work, but not 100%. Um, and that means that f um, for responsible AI to be a thing, we, we need to be able to trust the, the people that operate these models for us, because these um, um, 
the models are probably driving decisions or, or providing us with information um, that has to be trustworthy, etc. So I think um, the discussion about what is open source, what's the, what are the requirements for uh, open licensing of these models is absolutely crucial to that um, because that's a proven way to create the necessary transparency um, to be um, yeah, to have trust in the systems. And I do think that this requires a um, at least two-pronged approach um, from a technology perspective where um, the, the tooling and the way the systems are created supports that transparency, but also from probably a regulatory approach um, where through creating um, minimal requirements, especially based on certain risks, um, the, the, the tr transparency is also enforced. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Who else wants to add? Oita? Oh. Um, yes. I, I think um, the role of the open source community really is kind of going back to the educating and advocating um, for responsible use within the community. I think the open source community in general always has historically been that kind of just out focused on outreach, outreach within the developer development community, but also outreach out to users to help them understand. And I think in the current climate that we're in, there's so much hype out there. You know, there there is the two extremes. There are the people who who use it and don't really think about you know the implications, and then there are the other mm -hmm. the other extreme where people are saying, "I'm not going to use it because they're fearful or they don't understand." And so I do think the role of um, the open source community and the work that we're doing in generative AI commons uh, is to help advocate and educate and put tools in place to help the development community to understand the implications. Not with the focus of trying, you know, we always, you know, there's always the, the challenge of, uh, or, or, or with any guardrails, you know, there's the danger or the cry to don't stifle innovation. And I think we can, we all can say with confidence, just based on history, that open source community has always been about innovation and always about pushing the envelope. The envelope. And I don't see this as any different. It just allow, just need to probably in this case do a lot more education and outreach to help the general population understand the challenges as well as enterprise stakeholders who are also hearing from customers about what their what their fears are but just really the whole all the stakeholders in the loop to help them understand the what's required in terms of responsible AI great I just want to uh, plug uh, putting a little plug on our outreach and education work stream um, led by Ofer sitting down there and Oita is one of the major contributors. So in that work stream, we are currently cre um, creating education materials as well as you know hosting webinars and writing blogs, white papers. Uh, we produce a glossary of generative AI. So if you're interested, go to generative AI Commons website. You'll be able to get information and hopefully you can participate and help with some of the future um, initiatives there. Great, and anybody else wants to add to it, um, to this question? Oh, Pedro? Yep. Yeah. So, um, I mean, about the challenges of like uh, developing these kinds of things in the open source, I think, uh, I mean, working for a, a, a foundation that uh, is driving open source, uh, I think, uh, well, community, it's, it's always complicated, and I would say like managing the community, not the community itself, mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes I think uh, the advantages of people, like, like the advantage of people that are developing these technologies, closed source, is that, well, probably they have more resources uh, and they have some directives as, and some goals and they just work towards those goals and then, like, they can probably work quicker. Whereas when you're in an open source community, you have to agree with the community and actually come to a consensus. So, in terms of managing, that I would say that's a challenge. But on the other hand, I, th I would say like the community is also the main benefit of actually working in the open because, well, yes, 
it's slower, it's harder, and people are actually, like some people, there are actually volunteers that are doing this on their uh, uh, own time, and yeah, it's slower, but then you have a lot of diversity, a lot of voices there, and yes, reaching the consensus is far more complicated, but you can also be, let's say, more thoughtful in the way that you actually develop these kinds of technologies and actually like ask questions and encounter like early problems like or problems earlier than well people that are probably developing these things in close doors like are maybe just going to find out after they already put the actual model for AI let's say in production so right. yeah yeah I think I think that's that that's a really good point um as I mentioned, um, the Responsible AI Workstream is working on the Responsible AI framework. And um, one unique thing about this um, framework initiative is we're taking a global approach, right? And like Pedro said, it's good to have peer reviews. People you know, ask questions, challenge you, wh whatever that you come up with. And with this Responsible AI framework, we are incorporating um, data points and content from all three regions, like the Western region, U North America, and European regions, Asia Pac regions. We want to make sure that we are, you know, we're building AI not just in a responsible way, but also um, inclusive way. So having, um, doing it in an open community, it's really helpful in that sense. So earlier, one of you mentioned that, you know, we're going through this explosive growth. You know, while we're excited about the development of generative AI, there's also a lot of hype. And also, a lot of um, people are questioning, like, scrut scrutiny of AI. So what can open source AI projects do to contribute to the greater public understanding and uh, the scrutiny of the AI technologies? Who would like to tackle this question? OK, great. Thank you. Um, well, I think, like, the current example, no, with this generative AI wave, and we are seeing uh, these uh, companies start to actually start, no, with the models and open AI, and then we have the full community, uh, open source, and different flavors and, and, and companies and all, like uh, forcing the way to catch up in terms of performance, but also like bringing different stuff to the equation. Uh, we have seen um, Meta and Mistral, the like kind of model cards, the kind of transparency that they are bringing to, to the models is setting the standard for the rest to follow. So now you see the Google with Gemma, Microsoft with Fee, et cetera, et cetera. I think that that's contributing a lot because it's this, uh, I like to see it like a counterbalance, but not in a adversarial way, but just complementary way to what happens with other companies such as uh, OpenAI or Anthropic. So I think that that's something very good, something necessary. And also we are seeing this acceleration also the, of the different techniques and the, even the performance catching up. So that's, that's good and that's also showing like the kind of potential and risk of the technology. But then the other part that I think that is important is what you were mentioning, you know, the, the, the value of the communities and the complexity of the communities. In reality, if I, if I try to, to reflect on the different governance systems I have seen in different companies uh, from my current company, but also from others like IBM, Google, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, it's very similar. You have a process, you have a governance, different stakeholders, uh, different backgrounds. You need to validate. Sometimes you need to escalate. Sometimes you need to say, hey, we cannot go to this project. We will ask to someone else within the organization. So I think that that kind of mechanism um, brings a lot of value to these times in which we are trying to be uh, accountable and we have like this kind of regulations. And we have been doing this on the open source community for a while. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's another contribution that uh, is certainly helping to uh, well, the companies, they, they more or less know how to do it, but also the new companies bringing uh, new technologies and joining the ecosystem. So I think that that's a very good contribution, open source. Mm -hmm. Great. Anybody else? Pe Pedro? Or yeah, maybe uh, there's something, so I, I completely agree in, in like the sense of transparency, I think like developing these kinds of technology uh, open source like gives a lot of transparency. And um, I really like to think about, so um, I, I mean right now there are more and more models coming with open source licenses. Uh, and I think that's great, 
Uh, but I think there's a lot of value in going open source beyond the license that you attach to the model. So I, I really like to come back to, uh, well, w when I was doing my PhD, I, I had the pleasure of like participating of this project called Bloom, where we train an LLM, mm -hmm. multilingual LLM, and it was completely in the open, meaning that uh, all the process was open to the community and researchers all around the world. Uh, from the data collection, the uh, data cleaning, the pipelines, the training, the parameters, the uh, how many GPUs were used, how are we going to use the compute. And that gives a lot of transparency because you can very, uh, like very easily have this discussion around like, okay, how are we going to, like what's like the best and more responsible way of like spending that compute? Uh, because of course that that costs money, that costs energy, that emits that that has a carbon footprint. So you can have discussions like that and be completely transparent about that. You can be transparent about the data that you're feeding into the model, and even on the data question, you can also be like you can foster diversity. Like I remember from that specific project, one of the things like I as a native Spanish speaker, one of the things that we found out is that. Well, when we were working with the pre-training data, we looked at the Spanish uh, data set. And yeah, this, it was Spanish data, it was filtered, it was clean, it was good for pre-training the model. But it contained mostly, like more than 90% of the data was coming from Spain. So all of the other uh, Spanish speakers from South America, uh, from well Africa as well, because Equatorial Guinea also speaks uh, they also speak Spanish. So like all of these other speakers from these other regions of the world, well, yes, Spanish is very, uh, like it, it, it's, it's a little bit more homogeneous in a way than other languages, but we do have some cultural expressions, some, 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 ex some other things that we talked about that are probably not uh, talked about in Spain. And if you want to have a model that's representative of these communities, well, you need the data to actually be right. there. And actually developing these things in the open like, allows you to realize like, that, that there are problems like this. Nice. Anybody else? Oh, Marco? Um, I think you both highlighted strengths of the open source ecosystem. And... Um, uh, one of the key effects that open source collaboration has that it moves innovation like to higher layers of the stack. Um, so we're making um, building blocks, reusable technologies, uh, I think foundational models is what TI calls it. Um, and, and that basically means that um, the, the corporate world will in the future at some point start from a higher level, from a starting point of pre-trained, uh, pre-created models and um, I think there's a downside to that, and we're talking about like the, the transparency and the oversight um, mm -hmm. that is necessary here, uh, and that is it, is it will be very difficult to contain what kind of um, AI technologies are getting developed on top of these models, especially if the, the incremental innovation that you require to make a specialized system based on the open source offerings gets smaller as the open mm -hmm. source systems get better. Um, it, basically, every application will become available to anybody who wants to develop it. And there's there are pros and cons to that. It, it yeah. means um, bridging east-west west and, and north-south divides, but it also means making technology available to people that you don't want to, to have them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something that um, is uh, not really fully re uh, reflected yet. Um, there, there's a, a benefit and a cost to the proliferation of technology like this. Um, and, and especially when we talk about ethical AI, mm -hmm. um, one person's ethics might not be another one's, and then it gets really, really difficult. Yeah, that actually, that's a very good segue to my third question. Is obviously we are all believers of openness in you know making uh, creating AI, but um, you know on the flip side, somebody might argue that because all these models are open, tools are open, how can we you know what kind of uh, measure we can take to guard against bad actors, people who use open source models, open source AI tools to, to, um, to develop, you know, um, applications in a very, you know, evil applications in a very sensitive areas. Who would like to tackle that question? Oita. Yeah. Sure, I, I can tackle that. Um, and 
recently we had a webinar um, and it was focused on the, what on risk mitigation strategies or, mit, or navigating risk and we had um, three enterprise leaders who were on the panel um, at, for the webinar and one of them um, worked for Adobe he was head of enterprise architecture and as a as an enterprise you know they struggled with you know how do how do they integrate this new technology internally within the company as well as integrating it within their products that they offer to consumers and the the one solution that they came up with um, that other of uh, that other um, companies are beginning to implement is a process for internal review, and so they they have created a a committee of internal stakeholders represented by the decision makers, somebody from legal, security, product um, development, and and anything any. Um, any product that it, that they want to introduce has to go through this review panel, and it's not necessarily necessarily just to say yes or no, but it was a it's about the everyone around the table understanding what are the risks and trade offs, mm -hmm. and so that that collectively they could go into it and make the make um, informed decisions about the risks level you know associated with implementing these products and especially now in light of you know the EU AI act where there are all these risk levels in terms of unacceptable risk high level risk so to your question of how do you um, make sure that you that you know internally within organizations that make sure you're not developing something that would have potential high impact or would introduce bad actors intentionally but you know there is also the unintentional consequences mm -hmm. you know that may happen but at least if you're everyone around a table is discussing it and trying to make that informed decision i think it was a is a very good approach and something that others um, could probably mm -hmm. consider doing aj oh yeah i think like like everything in life, like uh, bad things will happen. We'll have bad actors. Right, it's not new. It's not yeah. new. Yeah. This is with artificial intelligence, it could be nucle nuclear bombs, uh, whatever. Yeah. We yeah. have uh, all kinds of experience as, uh, as humans, being very creative to find the way to do bad things. And, and also the notion of what's good and bad, the morals you were mentioning, depending on the geography, will be different. Um, you mentioned the AI Act. The AI Act, for example, is saying like uh, one of the uses that are forbidden is the social scoring. Social scoring is accepted in other geographies, mm -hmm. and it's totally fine. Like it depends on the on the local morals. But I like is uh, the, of the current moment and the opportunity that we have is that yes, we have the internal process on the companies, assuming that those companies want to do something good, they will have a process to protect. Now they're starting to talk about these intended uses and something that could go wrong this kind of pre-mortem that we could do. If I create a technology to detect faces, what can I do with that? What I'm supposed to do with this if I sell the solution to other companies, or what could go wrong, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that kind of mentality. But then I like that there are regulations. And I know that that's uh, not like a super popular kind of uh, <laughs> belief, especially in this kind of audience. But if you think before it was like the Wild Wild West, everyone could do whatever, mm -hmm. depending on the goodwill or the, the, the the willingness to do something good, but then with the regulations, and regulations usually start in Europe, uh, sometimes they start somewhere else, but well, with Europe and Canada, one day in the United States, who knows, and these regulations are put in some framework that goes to the accountability. It's not mm -hmm. just being ethical or responsible, we need to be accountable because otherwise we pay money and the responsibility of the C-suite, so that kind of forces the machine a little bit. And then the standards. And I know that this is like a very on the paper, on the processes, but the ISO, the 42001 for the management systems, all their kind of uh, standards. If you put that together, we are getting, at the very least, the recipe to minimize the risk. And everyone is talking about level of risk, about specific use cases, specific te not technology, but mostly use cases. So, so I think that that's good, and that will contribute to you know, re reduce the kind of bad things that can happen. But for sure, it will happen something bad. 
uh, <laughs> but a lot of good also. So right. that's oh. the kind of discussion we're having. Right. Right. Uh, Marco? Yeah. It, it maybe one addition. Um, you, you may have heard of the recent XC um, attack on, on uh, cybersecurity. Um, mm. And it's not an AI topic, but it illustrates that there are bad actors um, that don't necessarily care about regulation. Um, this was a premeditated attack, a social attack on the, g trying to gain access to a piece of software to sneak a backdoor into it um, and distribute it widely to uh, takeover systems. Yeah. Um, and I think this is kind of one worry I do have is um, I'm in fact also a fan of regulation in this field because it does create, it does set bars and say these are acceptable uses, these are acceptable uses that need to be audited before they're used, and these are unacceptable uses. And I think that is an important um, classification to have. But the attack shows us that there are actors who will not care about that. Uh, and that's something that um, the open source development community and the AI community, especially where they overlap, need to be aware of is that there are going to be people that are going to use those technologies um, for bad, not for good. Right. Um, and um, I don't really have an answer to that because it's kind of outside of our normal uh, field of comfort um, in the open source community. We didn't have that. We, we didn't have, um, uh, we had collaboration. We didn't really have attempts to take over our technologies for bad. Um, but it ha happened recently and it was discovered. Um, and so we need to be aware that things like that can happen and that the technologies that, are, that we develop here can be used for things that we don't want them to be used for. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how to prevent that, but maybe being aware of the problem and being transparent about what we develop is a good start to maybe identify those issues mm -hmm. then later on. Or maybe when we manage the, our open source projects, we can be more diligent about you know, security. Um, in fact, I'd like to put in another plug in. So um, there's a huge debate about open versus closed, right? AI, which one is more secure? and which one is more enterprise ready. And also you need to think about costs too, uh, future costs. So um, actually uh, I started this um, research effort um, on open versus closed generative AI from an enterprise slash user's perspective. So we're in the middle of that um, effort. So anybody who's interested in participating, if you have questions or you want to contribute, um, this effort is actually being led by a, a professor from uh, Tulane University. So if you're interested, please come to our model and data work stream and, or contact me. And I would love to have you um, join us. So, okay, so that was great. Um, I think I only have one more, a couple more minutes. So um, just very quickly, um, um, I'll have the panelists to give us some of their parting thoughts. And if they allow us to stay here longer, we can entertain some questions from the audience. But very quickly, let's start from, yeah, um, from Pedro. Yeah. And talk, uh, give, give us a parting thoughts about what, what do you think the number one thing that you want audience to remember when they are building AI in a responsible way? So uh, I, I guess like um, also from an open source perspective, like I think um, like it's good to talk uh, about transparency, uh, well, accountability, and also, well, uh, diversity, as, a, as I mentioned. Uh, and one thing that I want to put out there, uh, because I really would like to advocate to see like more projects like that is, uh, like, let's start developing these kinds of technology in the open, like not only uh, releasing a model and putting an open source license on it, because it, that's kind of like, I mean, it's a little, it feels a little bit like, I don't know, releasing, uh, I don't know, just the binary of uh, a program that you compile and saying that you can use this for free. And that's open to a certain extent, but that's not tr truly the, the way that the open source community has been doing things for many years. So like this accountability, diversity, uh, transparency, this can happen when you actually go open source all the way and like let people look at the whole process. I, I think that's... that's so, talking about diversity, I just want to show off, hey, we have diversity on this panel. Very equal <laughs> diversity. Oh. Um, parting thought. Um, I think we as a community have an yeah. obligation to continue this conversation 
to continue the dialogue and, and to, to not be, not shy away from the hard conversations. And uh, what I mean by that is uh, like, there, we, the right thing to do and, and asking the right questions. I, I was at a, uh, a conference a uh, couple of days, I was, came here from London, I was at, a, um, at the Unparsed conference and one of the themes around the workshop that I led on uh, around ethical AI poker was the question around just because you can doesn't mean you should, right? <laughs> you know, so how do we make sure that we are introducing things to, into the marketplace that are ethical, that are responsible, that are trustworthy, and, and mainly for the good of the, the, the community in general? We don't want there, we want to be able to continue to innovate. And, but there's just so much right now, so much hype around it, and especially when you touch high people, you know, in, in the entertainment industry, in media, music, and you start messing with them related to deep fakes and, you know, all this, um, then that, that just really puts a, uh, you know, gives the whole industry a bad rap, and we don't want that. And so that's why I mean that it's just it's our responsibility to just make sure that we, uh, you know, that we I don't want to use the word police because that sounds so strong that we help manage the risk and mitigate the risk uh, and be responsible with what we do. Okay, Michael. I would like to state two things. Um, one is, uh, it might sound boring, but um, it is incredibly important to have a proper definition of what open source AI is, and we know that there's- <laughs> We're working on uh, that right now. There are ongoing uh, efforts to define that, and, and, and papers that provide models, et cetera, and I think it's important to recall that, that open source means you can use, study, modify, and redistribute the work for any purpose by anybody. And, and if any of these conditions is missing, it's not open source. And, and a lot of the discussions about the usage of AI models goes back to like checking these six things, simple enough, and one is missing, like you can't use this for any purpose, and then it's not open source. So let's not abuse the name, the word open source for, for that. Um, and the second one is uh, kind of a call to, to, my, to all my own community here. Um, there's a massive opportunity um, in, in, in using the technologies that are currently emerging to bridge divides that we have in a community um, that are cultural and language barriers. Uh, we are, for example, aware that um, there's a South American open source community that writes code in Portuguese and Spanish and doesn't exchange very much with um, the, the English-speaking world uh, where we share a lot of other code. Um, and I really wish that um, once we solve all the ethics questions and, and um, uh, all these important questions that we get to apply these technologies to, to bring our community closer together. Mm -hmm. Good. I don't have that much smart to say after this uh, conclusion, <laughs> but uh, also just the, the simple kind of conclusion for me is that uh, in general it takes as much work to do something properly than to do it in a wrong way. Like uh, we're talking about the cost of uh, compliance, for example, for data protection, now for AI. But in reality, we do it in a proactive way. Like most of us want to do something that is positive, whatever that means. Do we want to do something that is done in a proper way that is, has no negative impact on society. So just think incorporating the, this kind of mechanism, something as simple as the principles on open source, the principles of AI on the Linux Foundation, mm -hmm. or different organizations, we have different series of principles. And then what does it mean? If we are saying that we are transparent, are we really transparent? Are we providing all the information we need to demonstrate transparency? And that will lead to discussion of one day the legal guy from, or a girl from the company will call you and say, hey, are we transparent? Are we mm -hmm. aligned with the regulation or the standards if we want to get a certification? They'll contribute also to the value of the company. Even for startups mm -hmm. right now, we're looking for investment. Being compliant or li limiting the risk is something that is something positive, right? That will increase the value of the company. So I think that there is an opportunity there. But again, if we do it in a proactive way, if we incorporate this kind of thinking process from the design, either in development or adoption. I think that that will help a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I don't know if we have time for questions, but um, yeah, since people are still here, why don't we just uh, open up the floor for questions? Um, here, I have, we have a question here. Oh, uh, you know what? I can do it. Oh, yeah. I'll be the, uh, yeah, here, here you go. Thank you for this engaging and insightful presentation. 
I'm uh, Sarah from Paris, lawyer working uh, at Blue Innovate on data compliance and security. And I was wondering, maybe I will be annoying, about the terms responsible AI. Is it a paradox? Because yep. uh, we do believe that AI is responsible, but at the end there is huge topics around it responsibility is. and who is uh, responsible, especially uh, in um, shared models yeah. and shared development. So. So I, it was, I want to tackle that first. So earlier I mentioned we are working on responsible AI framework um, that includes the definition. In fact, if you just do a simple Google, there's all kinds of definitions out there. It's a huge topic, but we 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 kind of look at a lot of researches and we come and then we picked out um, eight tenants for it was under responsible AI that includes transparency, accountability, safety, you know, sustainability, etc. Right, and so in each tenant, in you know, there's a definition as well, and I, I think it's just a general umbrella concept. And in a day, it's you know we want to be responsible. So when we're responsible, we are safe. You know, we are creating AI for human for the benefit of humanity. So it is, um, you know, it, it's a very big broad topic. And please join us on the responsible AI work stream. I will Anybody else it. wants to tackle that question? The definition of responsible AI. No, no definition. Yeah, like I said, it's a very broad topic, and um, you know it's uh, constantly evolving. But the the key point is we want to make sure that you know, like um, Oita said, right? Doesn't just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it, right? Just like, hey, I have access to cookies, it doesn't mean I should eat cookies every day. It's not good for me, right? <laughs> so um, it's good to pay attention to that. And at the end of the day, we want to create AI to benefit humanity. Okay, any more question? Oh, sorry. So, let's not dodge the question. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, we talked about ethics and we talked about responsibility. Um, and, and both are basically undecidable problems, right? We, we can't define a, a universal code of ethics that everybody will accept, as you've explained. Mm -hmm. um, and with responsibility, I think the, the thing I wanted to add is AI systems will not be responsible for anything. We operate them. Uh, they, as long as they don't you know, start to become independent and take over the world, which I hope will not happen, um, we will be responsible. So, so when we talk about responsible AI systems, we say let's develop them in a way that as humans we're able to control what they do, how they get to their conclusions, etc. But we cannot like, give up the idea that it is in the end always the human that runs the system, that owns it, that operates it, that is responsible for what the system does. And I think that's maybe one of the key takeaways is AI is great, um, but we still are responsible for the outcomes. Yep. Oh, Rita. And I, I, I agree with, with you on that, and I think it, it comes down to trust, right? It's, it, as users, as a community, developers, you know, it's about creating something that is, is using the tagline worthy of trust. And so that is, to me, um, how I would define it. Right. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah. So, um, oh, Kaylin, we have a, another question. Yeah. Thanks for the panel. My name is Kaylin Osborne. Um, I have a follow-up question on your question on responsible AI, which is, you know, one way that developers have been seeking to promote responsibility in AI use and development is creating new uh, licenses, um, like the Rail license. Do you think that is a a, a good way of promoting responsibility in AI use and development, or do you have, do you see other ways that uh, the open source AI community should be proceeding? The real license. Anybody wants to tackle that? Yeah, you can't. You want? Okay, go ahead. Okay, I don't want to be like jumping up here. Okay, so uh, there, there's a certain belief in the open source world that licensing solves every problem. <laughs> we can basically we write a license that everybody should share their code reciprocally to I share my how I share my code and that will basically take the problems away of like uh, free riders and, and people uh, not being compliant with the license etc. Um, we didn't really solve this problem these problems like from the start by just going with open source licenses. What we did create is uh, or communicate with the licenses are collaboration models. We said, if I give you a permissive license, we said, you can use this 
for whatever purpose, and you don't have to come back to me for permission or about any obligations. If we use a reciprocal license, then we expect you to act similarly to how I acted. And I, I think that this is all we can achieve um, when we write new licenses, is to signal the models, how we want the people that use the, the work to collaborate with us and how to build their products on top. Um, licenses will not solve ethical problems. Um, and, and they will probably not solve problems of responsibility. And uh, case in point, um, you may be aware that in open source licensing, we have this debate, should ethical aspects be part of the licensing for more than 20 years? And the answer is, we, we always rejected it. We said, we, we cannot decide if the use is for good or evil. Um, and therefore, um, no, no open source license has this. It says anybody can use this for any purpose. And if your purpose is evil, you should feel bad about it, but mm -hmm. the license does not forbid it. And I think this is the restriction, the, 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 the limitation that the concept of licensing puts on what we can achieve with it. And therefore, it's great. We need new licenses because open source licenses don't cover all aspects of AI properly. Um, but we should not expect that they solve these hard questions for us. Mm -hmm. and, and on the flip side, uh, I like to... Merkel, uh, I like to also, you know, because when we were building the MOF, Model Openness Framework, we also looked at real licenses. But then we decided not to use them for MOF because they are not OSI, um, you know, accepted licenses. So real licenses are not, so that means, I don't know, they don't enforce the four freedoms of openness. So you can argue, you know, um, Again, you know, how you define responsible AI, right? Is openness a part of that? But for this community, we strongly believe transparency, openness are very important to responsible AI. Uh, so maybe if I, uh, I can add something to the discussion, I mean, I, I mostly agree with what has been said about the licenses. Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, I think uh, in that discussion, the most important thing to realize is that there's a uh, huge gap between like licensing something and then enforcing that license. So the problem there is that when you end up putting a restrictive license on let's say an open source model, let's call it like that, or, or an open model, let's not call it open source, let's put it just open model. Uh, I don't know how much you're actually restricting the bad actors that you intend to like restrict with that license. Because if they are bad actors, they are going to do the bad thing that they want to do with that technology anyway. And you will end up just restricting the good actors that well want to probably have a little bit like more broader use case for, for the thing or the technology or the model that you just published. I mean, I can, I, I can bet you for sure that there are people using, like there are b bad actors today that are using open source model for bad. Uh, but, I mean, hopefully there are more people, and I'm, I'm not saying not AI technologies, like normal code technologies, but we are not asking the same question, or that is not as much. So, uh, because we kind of realize that, like, the way of doing these things in the open source, well, yes, it can have, it has some risk, but actually, as an open source community, we do have more control and more transparency on the things that we developed and probably control it a little bit better, actually, in the end. Okay. Well, I think uh, I got the sign. All right. Thank you so much, panelists, and thank you so much, attendees. That was an interesting conversation. And let's never stop talking about responsible AI. Thank you. <laughs>